Well, one today is Thursday, January 19, 2023, and this is the week in charts. What are we talking about? Well, for that, I want to thank everybody for attending. I appreciate taking your time out of your busy schedule. If you would like to participate live and you're watching this on YouTube, which is probably about a day delayed, feel free to join us live. The more the merrier. Have room for about a thousand in the room. And it's been a while since we've approached that number. Uh, anyway, DaveLeonard.com slash webinar. Register even if the link is old or go to my website on Thursdays. Usually it is a banner ad up on days of the show. All right, so what are we going to focus on? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. And then I have a bunch of little things tonight. And one thing that, that could be pretty big that we just got to scratch, that we'll just probably scratch the surface on, but we'll see how much we can get through. I have an over example. I want to do a brief update on the intraday trading experiment that I've been working on. A TF10% update. And crypto has been pretty hot. And I want to show you what I've been doing there. And hopefully it'll it'll keep on keeping on. We had a little correction. I think it was last night or the night before. And then it started to heat up again. And a few weeks back, actually it's probably been about a month now, somebody wanted to know what it takes what does it take to become a successful trader and uh, i started working on that a month or so ago and I'll, I'll start uh i'll show you some of the stuff that i've come up with so far and it's i think it's something that could certainly be fleshed out quite a bit and it's something that as i was looking at it earlier tonight i think each one of the topics could could be a whole presentation in, in and of itself and that'll make a lot more sense in a minute. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or, as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can have between now and then. Now, last show, I was talking about the intraday trading experiment. And, and one of the things that I really want to focus on or talk about in, as it goes or, or as we do more and more of these presentations is some of the, some of the pitfalls of doing this sort of thing. And, and I've spent many years preaching against day trading, and I'm trying to kind of bottle this up a little bit to where I could be more and more hands off. On a route day, on a beautiful day when it just goes down, sort of like we had on the 18th, as you can see, it's kind of opened a little stronger, and then it just kind of imploded the rest of the day. You can be a little bit more hands off, although I think I was pretty busy on the 18th just trying to pull as much money as I could out of the market. But the point I've been making initially with this, without getting into all the caveats, is that on choppy days, if you're not careful, you could chase your own tail. So on this day here, I think that was Tuesday, I lost $232. On Wednesday, we had a nice route day lower, and that day turned out to be okay. And then today kind of sucked. We, we dropped for a little while. And then we went up for a little while, looking like that was a big reversal. And then, nope, we turned right back down. And I did make some mistakes, which caused this number to be a little bit bigger than it should. I got into a, a cheap crypto stock, and I did not pay attention to the spread. And, and so there's, there's a lot of little things that are being unearthed as I go through this experiment, and that being one of them. And I do have some futures still on, so we'll see how that shakes out. And I'll just probably add those profit or loss to tomorrow's p &L. And oh, by the way, on Friday is missing in here. I forgot to put Friday in. Friday was a minus 200, like right at about minus 200. So you can see, yeah, not a fantastic week. Uh, now, one thing that I do in, in doing this, I want to point out to you is usually after a pretty good day like this, you get a choppy day. So I need to come up with some sort of choppy day rule, maybe trade a little smaller on the following day when the market's just chopping back and forth or if it chops back and forth. Every now and then you get a route day or a trend day or a holy grail day where it starts at one end like this one did and then ends at the other. When these occur, I, I think I'd almost, I hate to say you'd be stupid not to, but you'd be crazy not to, to day trade, although day trading can really take its toll on you and I'm having some physical issues from doing it which is just compounding on all the all the computer work that I've done over the years and everything but right now my shoulders are, are pretty tight and even sometimes on a good day I feel like I, I I got wiped out and lost money so 
the jury's still out. If I could figure out a way to kind of bottle it up, so to speak, and be a little bit more hands off. I was pretty hands off early on. And then when I started working on this, especially since I've really been reporting a lot of these trades and showing a lot of these trades, I, I'm finding myself really getting uh, kind of sucked into the, the flickering ticks, as Todd Harrison calls them. So anyway, I'm going to report a lot. There's a lot of little things I want to get into, and I've been taking a lot of notes on this. And so just stay tuned for upcoming shows, and I'll show you what I've been doing, and we'll figure out whether or not it's all worth it. Okay, we do have an ogre example this week. I did mention it in Facebook, and it was Tesla. And I'm going to walk you through the trade there in just one second, and, and including some mistakes that I made on that, which kind of dovetails into some of the issues with the with the intraday trading. But anyway, it, I use FinViz, and I have a little opening gap reversal scan. If you're interested in that, I can give it to you. And all I'm doing is I'm just saying, hey, I want to stock the gap up for shorts at least 5% or down for potential longs at least 5%. And I want them to have a lot of volume. I think at least 500,000 is where I have it set. You want to if you're going to trade opening gap reversals or ogres, as one of you guys named them, and I forget who gave me the name, but thank you, you're going to have to trade more liquid stocks and ideally more known stocks. Something like a Tesla does work out well. There was a really big one a while back. I'm trying to think of the name of the company. It's like an AMD or something like that. Some, some not a generic name and not an inefficient stock, kind of just the opposite of what we want to look for in our longer term trend trades. We want a little bit thicker stock uh, within reason, or I should say we don't want too thin of a stock, but we're not looking for a big thick stock like we would in the ogres. And the reason you want a Tesla or something like that is you want a lot of participation in a stock. If you try to play an ogre in a thin stock, maybe the gap wiped out everybody that was um, was gonna trade it anyway, or, any, or, or there's not enough people to come in and buy it. And you can get a lot of trouble trading ogres in something that's inefficient. Uh, ideally, you want to search out inefficiency for your longer term swing to intermediate type trades. And then you want kind of just the opposite again in your ogre trades. And I've done plenty of uh, presentations on opening gap reversals. So if you go to my YouTube channel and, and once you're at YouTube, just look for at Dave Landry and you can find me there. But anyway, Tesla, obviously in a longer term downtrend and fairly persistent trend in more recent times, it began to pull back. Now, again, what I, the point I was trying to get to, I don't know if I got there or not. It's been a long day. See, doing all this screen work is, is you know, and I'm still like looking over there to see what the future's doing, you know. Is it worth it? I don't know. We'll see. Um, <laughs> anyway, it, this one did come up, come up fit this because it wasn't a huge gap. And that's why I said, hey, not a huge gap. And so I didn't notice it until. I till the opening bell, I happen to keep Tesla on my screen just because it's been in a downtrend lately. And I've been looking to try to pick off a little piece of it every now and then. Anyway, so you can see that opening gap there. And I'll zoom this in in just one second. And in this case, it, it turned out to be pretty textbook. It, it wasn't that textbook intraday, believe me. And I'll show you my mistake there. But if we zoom in, this is the daily chart. You could see on Tuesday, or was was that Wednesday? That was yesterday. Yesterday it had a gap higher, so it gapped about three or four points higher. What's that? Thirty? Yeah, about uh, about four points higher. And then it began to come in. Now, it's funny when you look at a daily chart. It's like, man, these things look easy. You know, you get an opening gap, just short the damn thing. But when you're looking at the intraday chart, it's a little bit tougher. And sometimes you got to be a little aggressive on these and you can't mess around too much and you got to get, you have to get in as soon as possible. So here's a 30 minute chart. You see the gap open and then it began to implode. And I shorted a little bit above where I had this little arrow. And I couldn't understand why on the first trade, I only made a buck 19. Now you can see because this is an experiment um, with this intraday trading i actually only did this in one account but i will go i will occasionally get aggressive with the with the opening gap reversals but this was not a greater than five percent one i didn't think it would be the mother of all opening gap reversals and it, it, it wasn't exactly the mother of all opening gap reversals but it was a decent one 
where you could have made a little money. And I think what happened here, in fact, I know what happened. I went and looked at my notes. So I was trying to get two points out of the trade. I figured two points would be a good risk parameter. And down here, I was down over two points and I, I don't, or up over two points. The stock was down over two points where I got in. And I should have just put in a limit order to take out half of those shares. But instead, I happened to notice that it had made this sharp retrace and I decided to go ahead and bail out on half of them as quickly as possible. And then I didn't want to I didn't want to let it go too far uh, against me, but fortunately it did roll back over. And on that trade, you can see I got out here. And the reason I got out here, I, I think if I would have done this trade on a Thursday, I would have tried to hold on all the way into the close and squeeze out a little bit more. But I had about six points in the trade and maybe almost seven down here somewhere and i was just thinking that was kind of a gift horse type of situation i ended up with 5.6 on the second loaf now it's only 50 shares of the second loaf but it turned out to be 339 dollars better than the poke in the eye you did that you know i know i hate to do this fuzzy math stuff because if you look at what i lost today you'd be losing like uh 200 something thousand dollars a year but if you could occasionally pick up something like this if there was a way where you could pick up one every day you could make an extra seventy five thousand dollars a year on top of everything else you're doing but be careful with that annualization game and if you do just make sure that you realize well a four hundred dollar loss would equate to about 100k a year uh, 252 trading days in a year roughly give or take one or two every now and then and hundred dollars a day is twenty, roughly twenty-five thousand. So that's one way of looking at that. Anyway, so I, I want to continue to flesh this out and get into it in a lot more details. And as I have more and more examples, I'll show you. I would recommend you go in and watch last week's presentation if you haven't already done so, where I showed where you can, in certain cases, especially on a route day, be a little hands-off, where you you place an order to get in. And then you place two orders, a limit order and a trailing stop order. And then you can sort of go about your life. At least that's what I'm trying to do. Now, I've showed this before, and a couple of you guys had asked me about it. And so I just want to show you one more time. My hope, and boy, when you hope in markets, it, it rarely comes true, does it? But my hope with Bitcoin was that it would be possible to to use it as an investment or a trading vehicle so to speak when the overall market is not doing well but it, come to find out there's a there's a big correlation between bitcoin and the s p 500 and i knew that going into ChartCon back in october and about a week before ChartCon chart chart con we had to pick sides for bull bear debates. And I went up against Greg Schnell and Greg didn't care. He says, ah, I'll take the bull side because I wanted a, the bear side because I'm a trend following moron. So I took the bear side because it was going down and he took the bull side, but he had a caveat was he was gonna watch the S&P for a timing signal. I thought that was pretty smart. And his whole thinking was, if you think about risk on risk off, in a risk on market, people are going to go after things like Bitcoin and such, and of course the stocks themselves. So his point was S&P had to get above a certain level or forget exactly his um, reasoning or his buy point or whatever, but he was bullish on Bitcoin with the caveat. So let me show you this real quick and I'll answer your question. So you can see I have in orange the S&P 500, and then in black, I have Bitcoin. So you can see there's a nearly 100% correlation going on here. And this correlation stayed pretty much the same. Now the scaling is, is much different because of the prices. But then you can see we had a negative correlation here where the S&P 500 went up and then Bitcoin went down. So they kind of traded independently of each other. And then you can see that their correlation came back. And the the reason, one reason I'm showing this is in addition to being asked about it, 
is that sometimes you you have to look at your investments or your trades and even though you might be long bitcoin which has nothing to do with the s&p 500 in a way your exposure is sort of your beta or whatever they call it uh, when you look at the correlations is actually correlated to the s p 500 so i just find this kind of interesting uh, there's no particular trading that i'm doing off of this but maybe if you guys wanted to noodle with it which you could do and I, I i built a chart i didn't put it in here but you could take dollar sign vtc usd and put a colon after it and then put dollar sign spx and then maybe see if there's a little trading system you could work on or, or build off of that and i'll noodle with it next week and see if there's anything there to kind of help you play these correlations or maybe when the correlations diverge all right let me do a brief market oh before we do that uh you can scan the overnight markets for gaps to set up where the market opens you can scan the overnight market for so is that a question uh my scan all it is is i go to finviz and then i just look for opening gaps okay it's a, it's a question yeah so I use Finviz, and and you will need. I found out I experimented a while back, just in case you could do it for free. You will actually need a paid account because it seems like there's a little delay on the open um, if you don't have a paid account with Finviz. And I don't know how much that is. If you go to my website and click on the big orange thing in the middle of the website, I have an affiliate link for Finviz, and I I don't think they pay me or anything. They just give me like a free month or something. If somebody signs up so, but um you know it's better than poking the eye so if you do sign up sign up through me on on the fin viz i'd like to see stock charts do um more and more of that kind of stuff what changed in october everything including bitcoin changed direction i don't know october <laughs> it's just october it seems like that's what happens every october but uh we'll we'll take a look at bitcoin live here in a minute and we'll see if we can glean anything going back to october all right, I want to do a brief 10% TFM system update. It's the same thing I've been saying for months here, or weeks at least. The the sell line or the buy line, I call it the buy line, and it's just they called it Landry percent of code when they did the plugin. And if you have Star Charts ACP, like this video, and that'll give you access to the plugin. The plugin is down here. Click on that. And for now, I keep saying for now, uh, but uh, go ahead and get it just in case I change my mind. For now, it's free. And every now and then somebody will ask me, why are you giving it away? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, maybe at some point in time, there are a few things I'd love to add to it. And if, if I go through all that trouble and the programmers go through all the trouble, then at that point, I might uh, charge a nominal fee for it. But anyway, you can plot it for free in ACP. It's called Landry Percent of Code, close. And you see I have 90 and 50 here, and this is a weekly chart. And I know you guys that are see this every week or your eyes are glazing over, just bear with me. I'll get, I'll get through it quickly. So weekly chart, percent of close, 90, that means it's 10% or 90% of the closing high. So it's 10% away from the closing high. And it's 50 weeks. And by accident, as I say each week, when I designed this, I didn't realize it had so much lag in it to get you back into the market. So it doesn't really work well if you have a V-shaped recovery, but the, the whole point of the system was to get you out of the market before something bad happened. And longer term, it really beats the hell out of, out of the buy and hope because every now and then you get a bear market and the S&P gets a 50% haircut. And that's a secret to longer term success. I'm talking much longer term success. And the buy and hope is universally preached and they're just it's just such it's such bullshit for lack of a better word because it just doesn't work and every asset class and i don't know who said this but i i say it often because i've witnessed it myself many a times and, and some of you guys here are nearly as old as me i know a, a few of you a little older you've witnessed it too i've seen nearly every asset i could think of lose half of its value and whoever said this and i'll try to find try to give them credit but they somebody once said that every asset at some point in your lifetime will lose 50 percent of its value and that's why i'm a trader instead of an investor it doesn't mean i won't hold on to things longer term 
And one thing I'm working on is some technical analysis, apologetic, so to speak, where I explain why I use technical analysis and why you should too. And in that, I basically just say, look, we're not using a bunch of indicators. It's not a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo because there is a lot of whole bunch of mumbo jumbo out there. All I'm doing is basically performance-based investing. So you can see the S&P 500 in this simple little system, when it underperforms, when it drops more than 10%, we begin looking to get out. It also has to be below its 50-week moving average, but that's really not that complex if you think about it. So when it drops below its average price over the last 50 weeks and that's 10% below its 50-week closing high, you exit the market. That's the entire sell signal right there. So this is a performance-based investing type of system. And when I get into stocks, I get into strong stocks. If you were gonna put together your fantasy football team, you which I don't play, and, and uh, I'm not big into sports, but I think that if I got into that, it would consume me just because of the obsessive personality <laughs> I have. And that's the... That's why I tell my friends who who want me in their teams to or want me to join that I won't do it because I know myself. I'd be Googling how to beat the system and whatever and probably be plotting charts on players and, and stuff. But anyway, you don't, if we're, what little I know about it, I, I'm pretty sure you don't rush out and try to get the crappiest players you can. And I don't know how long you, how, how much you could switch traders around, uh, players around, but I'm pretty sure that if you've got somebody who's underperforming, you don't play that player and you try to you try to get a better player. Now, another analogy would be like if you're putting together a team of employees, right? You want the best employees you could find, the best employees you could afford, the smartest, the brightest, the hardest working. And and when you got, let's say you've got three employees working for you and two are busting their butt and one is sitting on his who are you going to fire? Well, you're not going to say, well, the guy sitting on his bus butt is due to start working any day now. So I'm going to wait for a couple of years to see if he starts to work. And I'm going to get rid of these other guys that are doing all the work right now. No, I mean, even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous. Okay. Anyway, so performance-based investment vesting is, is one way that I look at technical analysis. And getting way back to the point I tried to make earlier is that it has this lag in, in it, which I discovered after I published the system several years ago. I don't know how many years it's been out, maybe maybe four years. It's been a while, as long as I can remember. Or I can't remember when I didn't have this system, but it, it's uh, I think it's maybe four years or so, maybe a little bit longer. But anyway, after 50 weeks, you're no longer looking at this closing high. This right here becomes a closing high, and then this becomes a closing high. So you can see this line begins to drop. So when you get into prolonged bear market like we did in the 2000, was it 2003, 2004 bottom and 2009 bottom, the buy line will catch up. Okay. Okay, Big Dave, the dollar topped in October, precious metals, commodities, and Bitcoin took off. Chart the do, chart to track the dollar U, UP with a per, with a little VIX, and it helps pretty much every time frame right now. Yeah, you know, one thing to remember, I, I think you're on to something, and I'll, and I'll do a little analysis on that by for next week, or maybe uh, I'll noodle with it, and we could talk about it in the Facebook group. But one thing you have to remember with the intermarket technical analysis is. It only works when it works. And I remember years ago, I was advising a bond fund and I looked at the dollar and a couple of other things and, and it really helped us with bonds, but then they would decouple a lot and invert a lot. But when those two relationships were in sync, it was very important for us to pay attention to them. So we'll take a look at that. And then we get to the live charts, if there's any time left, I'll, I'll see if we could uh, do anything on the fly. Okay, as I said earlier, somebody a few weeks back reached out to me and they wanted to know what does it take to be a successful stock trader? Well, it takes willingness to throw nearly all conventional wisdom out the window. When I meet someone new to trading on the street that's not that doesn't know who I am, 
and they start talking about their buy and hold and and they just hold through everything bad and all this other stuff. I used to being the the unagreeable person that I am, and I didn't know I was unagreeable, so I took a personality test based on the mental edge of trading, which was uh, Larry Williams' son wrote the book, and I, I, I need to remember his name. I, I have the book. It's in the library. But he suggested taking a personality test, and he talks a lot about how different personalities are, make up good or bad traders. And one of the things I've gleaned from the book is even if you have a not for good personality for trading, and I have the worst trade I could possibly have, I scored very low or virtually no score in agreeableness. And I didn't realize it was that unagreeable because I'm always right. You know, it's like <laughs> nothing to disagree with. Uh, I'm working on that. But anyway, knowing that I'm not agreeable when something goes against me, I'm like, you know what, David, David, maybe you could be wrong, okay? But anyway, the getting back to the being willing to throw the conventional wisdom out the window, it used to really irk me when people re would regurgitate the Kool-Aid drinkers uh, about how the market always goes up longer term. Well, that's based on an 81 year time horizon. And as Sweet Brown once said, ain't nobody got time for that. So, but anyway, it actually makes me feel good in a way because so many people out there have it wrong. And that allows us traders type, us, us traders type to go in and apply our performance based investing and make money on, on, the situation, uh, or I, I hate to say the predicament of these people, but for lack of a better word, we are trading traders and not markets. And when I meet these people or hear people on the radio or TV or whatever talking about all this conventional wisdom, which is absolutely wrong, I'd say 99% of it, it makes me feel good that a lot of people still believe in this, and that's going to help this performance based investing to continue to work. Now, Here's a big one, learning how not, if you can learn how not to interject logic into market action. I often say that the wise, W-H-Y-S, will become wise, W-I-S-E, down the road. You'll find out why the market sold off or why it likely sold off down the road, but it doesn't really matter at the time what is, is. And that's a reoccurring theme that I often talk about. You have to believe in what you see and not in what you believe. Again, for somebody with a low score in agreeableness, sometimes that's hard, but it's amazing how what is is. Linda Rasky once said, if you want to know which way a market is headed, ask a six-year-old kid. And I said that so many times, people started quoting me. And so I, I stopped saying it because I want Linda to get credit for it. But it's true. A six-year-old is not caught up in the situation in Nigeria or any other thing that they believe could affect the stock price, they just look at the chart and they can see it's going up, it's going down, or it's going sideways. So believe in what you see and not in what you believe. You're gonna to have to have the ability to be wrong a lot. And I read this somewhere recently or fairly recently, recently within the last couple of years at least, that I think they were talking about trend following, but it certainly applies to trend following. As a trend follower, you're going to be wrong a lot and you're going to spend a lot of time less wealthy. It's like you lose money, lose money, lose money, bam, knock it out the park, lose money, lose money, lose money, lose money, bam. And even when you knock it out the park, so to speak, on a, on a position or two, a lot of that position, I've done complete presentations just on that alone is giving up open profits and i think his name is one's a blues guitarist and one is a as a ex hedge fund manager hedge fund manager but i think it's robert frey and you can see the original presentation that he did on youtube and you can see many other presentations that i did too you have to be willing to go against innate psychology and in more recent years, or I keep saying more recent years, it's been a decade since I started studying neurology, or 12 years now. But you you will have to understand how trading the trading world and real world often are worlds apart, 
and you have to understand the psychology of the other players through the charts and more importantly the psychology of yourself and then you have to be constantly cognizant of that and I, I used to find myself every time I'm walking in the office for some reason I, I would start just placing trades everything looked great and nine out of ten times I lose money on those trades and I couldn't figure out what was going on and then I reread it was uh, either like a Gladwell book or or something along those lines or a behavior science book and they talked about the fact that they did I think it was Israeli judges gave far more lenient sentences after lunch than before lunch and they figured out that the judge was no longer hangry hungry and angry right and he was feeling good because he had a nice full belly right after lunch he's like yeah you know we'll just give you a few years for that murder as opposed to life in prison and that kind of struck a chord with me it's like holy crap that's what i'm doing when am i coming back in the office well i'm coming out coming back after eating breakfast and i'm feeling good I'm, I'm getting starving for lunch i go to lunch i'm coming back after eating lunch and i'm feeling good so it's going to take a little time but you will begin to recognize these things and the more you know and the more you study trading psychology and neurology, the better off you are. And I would say work 10 times harder on the trade, trade psychology in yourself than you do actually on the methodology. And the methodology is, is fairly simple, especially following something like mine, which kind of dovetails into the next part. So the next point is find something simple and easy to follow, and you have to resist complexity, okay? And uh, what's Ackman's razor? Um, I forget exactly how it goes, but I have like a half a dozen sayings when I get into the simplicity that you should be using with trading. That's why I trademarked Trading Simplified because that's that's my ultimate goal is just to reduce the complexity of all this. You're gonna have to have the ability to separate luck from skill, and that's not easy. Any Duke. I couldn't get into our latest book, and, and I need to try. It's a book about making decisions. It was kind of, it's more of like a workbook, and I don't really do well with those for some reason. But uh, her, her book, Thinking in Bets, was really good. I'd recommend you read that. If you go to davelearner.com slash books dash two dash read, you can see all of these books that I'm talking about tonight, and uh, do go out and read them. But her big point is that when we, she's talking about poker players, but when we have a bad trade, we tend to shrug it off as bad luck. And then when we have a good trade, we tend to see it as skill. And sometimes they're just the opposite. Sometimes it's like your lack of skill is re what recorded that, what, which caused that loss. And your luck is what gave you that gain. And the market, as I preach, can be a bad teacher. Here's a big one, willingness to hold yourself accountable to others and yourself. And the and yourself is the is a really hard thing. And that's why if you notice over the past several years, I've become more and more open and transparent, especially or at least when it comes to like uh, showing things from a model account or showing things I talk about. So like if in the trading service, if I show we're buying a thousand shares, a hypothetical whatever i'll go and buy a thousand shares and then i'll show you the management of the position and whether or not i did what i should have done so that helps me to hold myself accountable and just like i said a little while ago i think it was last thursday i forget which one but if you go in and watch a presentation i was kind of anxious to get out of one of those intraday positions but i said nope i'm going to exit market on close because you know why i wanted to show you guys that i actually did what i said i was going to do and I was a little hands off with that. So hold yourself accountable to yourself and others. I have a, a friend, a little newer to trading, but he's been around the business forever. And through osmosis, he's picked up a lot. And he's actually pretty good at it, but he told his wife going in, like, look, this is not gonna be a willy nilly thing. If I lose X amount, we're going to quit. I'm gonna tell you how much I make or lose every day and if I'm following my system or not. And then, you know, the quick story I always say here, I hope it can make it quick. <laughs> I had a client and he does really, really well, blows up, really well, blows up, really well, blows up. And right around one of those blow up phases, I said, look, you do a really good job following the system. You know, you shoot from the hip with some other stuff, but for the most part, you pretty much follow along with the service. And 
And and as you know, there's going to be losses, and he just takes the losses and and, and just doesn't it doesn't even phase him at all. I mean, I, I get more pissed off at my losses than he does with on stuff that I recommended that we both take. But he still has that little bit of a blow up characteristic. And I said, look, why don't you tell your wife a little bit about me? Tell her that I'm not the grand poobah. Tell her that I will be wrong. And we might have drawdowns that last months, and we might not make a whole lot of money for five or six months at a time. But then magically, we'll, we're going to catch a few stocks, and we're going to do really well over time. And explain to her, you're going to follow the system and blah, 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 and do all these things. And uh, he interjected and said, no, no, that would end the marriage. So he's not only going to hold himself accountable to himself, but he's not going to allow himself to be accountable to anything other. So that's that's a big one. And that's a tough one. It really is. Now, willingness to do whatever it takes, even especially if that makes you uncomfortable. Doing the hard thing sometimes is really hard. It, it's hard to buy stocks sometimes when they're up quite a bit. But if you have the setup and you should do that, then you should do it. And I see a lot of things just off the top of my head. Like, for instance, a couple of my, I could, I could almost look back at every huge winner that we've had. And there's going to be people that don't take the setup because like in one case, I think it was like AL, ARLP, which was one of our biggest winners, started in the fives and went up into uh, double digits. It had a 20% stop and they said, no, I can't trade a stock with a 20% with a stop, but that's what it called for. And that's kind of the hard thing. Now adjust your share size down until you feel more comfortable with that. But there's gonna be a lot of things you have to do that make you uncomfortable. And I'm kind of just scratching the surface there, but that's a pretty damn good start. So is that all? Well, it's going to take time. It's going to take you time to find a conceptually correct methodology that fits your psyche. I have some really simple stuff. I can show you like little simple patterns in IPOs, and you can trade those almost overnight. I don't recommend you do that. I'd recommend you go in and find 100 examples historically, find some that work play devil's advocate, et cetera. But I can give you a fairly simple methodology, pullbacks, like something like TKOs. All you need is one pattern to be successful. Go in and learn one pattern and trade just that one pattern until you become successful. And by the way, if you're not successful with one pattern, you're not going to be successful with 10 or 20. But the problem is everybody has to go in and, and do the little holy grail hunt. And I preach against that, but maybe if I didn't go through such a holy grail hunt, I wouldn't be, you know, where I am. It's hard to say, you know, looking back in time, you look at the good, the bad of things, all of that made you who you are, but I could save you a, a, a boatload of time by telling you not to chase that holy grail. Figure out something, work on something simple first and figure out how to make that work. And if you still must, then of course, go in and, and do some grail hunting. And I still look at new little systems every now and then. I will still noodle with things and and I'm reading some old, old books on, uh, I believe that the, the best books of technical analysis are about 100 years old. And I still read these old books every now and then and try to noodle with some things or use that as a genesis for ideas. So I still do a lot of research, but I always come back just to the simple plot, simplified trend following and the simplified hybrid money management. And I follow that. How do I get your information on using FidViz to find the ogre. Um, you can email me, uh, davelander.com slash contact or Dave Leonard, or david davelander.com and I'll, I'll send you the link. And if I get a, a boatload of requests, I'll just put the link uh, on the website. I don't know if members, I have a, in my members area, I have a resource section. I don't know if that's behind the firewall or not off the top of my head. If it is behind the firewall and I get a lot of requests for the, um, the scan, I'll uh, I'll put it where it's it's not behind the firewall. But yeah, for like a couple of one-offs, just email me, David, David Leonard, com. it's fine. Okay, you're gonna, it's gonna take some time to study a money management system. Again, I could show you mine, teach you mine in 10 minutes, right? You can get a lot of it on YouTube and certainly you can get it on the back end of my website. But you're gonna have to, gain confidence in that, understand that, and wrap your head around that. And it's going to take time. 
And then, of course, it's going to take a boatload of time to wrap your head around trading psychology. And uh, what is it? Um, I can't remember the Latin for it. Encora, Empora, something like that means I am still learning. And allegedly, Michelangelo said that at 80-something years old. And I certainly am still learning, especially going through this little experiment, learning that it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be all the time. Anyway, you're going to have to take a little time to place orders and manage positions. This doesn't take a tremendous amount of time, but it still takes time. And not having that time, and, and I nearly missed a few huge winners. And uh, the Facebook group, I have to admit, has been a godsend for me because uh, there's been one or two big winners where I'm off chasing rabbits or rainbows or whatever the case may be. And I noticed like one of you guys talking about a position once it triggers, like, hey, that triggered or whatever. And I'm like, holy crap, I totally missed that because I was off, you know, chasing rabbits and rainbows, like I just said. So you will have to make sure you make the time. It's going to take some discipline to do that. You might need some commitment devices. So uh, in more recent times, I started using a, a, a digital notebook. And I I have like a little cut and paste that I show that um, that I put on each page so I make sure I'm looking at all the things I need to look at. So you'll have to come up with your own little commitment devices for that. Obviously, it's the time to do your analysis. I go through a couple thousand charts every night, and I look at a lot of charts throughout the day, probably you know, hundreds if not thousands. So that's going to take some time. Um, if you're doing the swing to intermediate term trading, you could probably get your analysis done maybe an hour a day after the market closes, and you can place your orders and go about your life. But you don't have to be that on top of it. You could use alerts to watch the screen for you if, if you have to watch the screen and things like that, and maybe kind of alert you that, hey, I'm getting close to profit target. Maybe I need, need to apply a little discretion or something. And you're gonna have to do some time, some time to do your ongoing research. Like I just said, I'll just, I'll get an idea about something or I'll just watch the market and try to figure out a way to make persistency work or when these bars kind of stack on top of each other, is there some sort of system there? And, and as you just saw a few years back, I was, I was thinking, well, what if you just got out of the market when it drops 10% and then I added a moving average in it? Voila, I have a system. And then I guess uh, time to do your ongoing analysis, okay? That's, that would be your, um, your daily analysis, which I just, I think I said that earlier. In time to get your head on straight mentally and physically, I've I've gotten back in the gym seriously. Uh, luckily, a couple of years back, a buddy of mine and, and a friend of his invited me to work out in a little their little home gym, or one of the guys. And uh, so every morning at seven o'clock a.m., I'd go over there, and I got in the habit of going every day. And uh, kind of long story endless, but I ended up. Since I started going every day, we we would kind of like jaw jack each other. You know, oh, what would Jocko say? I bet Jocko's working out today and stuff like that. And it really helped me to kind of create a commitment device to go every day. And now I'm just in the habit of going. And, and believe me, there's a lot of days today was a, a great example where I just didn't feel like going. But I forced myself to go. And it's like sometimes I'm in the gym and people, I'm getting to know a few guys in there. And they're like, oh, see you tomorrow. I'm like, oh, crap, I don't feel like coming tomorrow. But, you know. It helps. And so I, I think I would be in in horrible shape, especially with all the markets I'm trading right now, if I wasn't going to work out in the morning. And I work really hard to get my head on straight early in the morning. I get up at, uh, today it's probably, it's probably like 4.30 today, but I try to get up, I think my alarm set at 4.55 or something like that. So I get up every day and work on my morning pages and that just kind of like gives like a like a brain dump of everything that's in my head. And a lot comes out of that. And I can't tell you how great that that has been. I did them, as I've said before, I did them like 20 something years ago before I was actually married. And that's how I dated because like I found some notes where I, I, I was thinking about uh, marrying Marcy and actually had it in my notes. So, so I know it's 20 something years ago, but I got busy or whatever. And for some reason I stopped doing them. And then I read, at least the first few pages of Ju Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, and she talks about morning pages. And I don't, I don't follow exactly what she says to a T, 
but I just kind of like get whatever's in my head out. And, and usually about halfway through getting stuff out of my head, I actually began to two things. One, write about trading in the sense of what did I learn on the prior day or what's going on and what mistakes have I made and what commitment devices could I put in place and what things could I do to, to become better? Because it's really a journey more than a destination. You know, it's like, I love to just say, Hey, I got it all figured out. I'm done. You know, it, it, it doesn't happen like that. But the, the, and the other thing the morning pages does is a lot of the, the, the content you see on my website and the videos and all, and I'm actually working on um working on two books, but I think it's I'm gonna do a smaller version of a bigger book, and that's all coming out of my head in the morning pages. After about page and a half of, like I said, doing kind of like a brain dump, I start the uh, brain gets warmed up, and before you know it, I start getting ideas about a lot of things and get a lot of writing in. So I would urge you to to make that part of what it takes to become a successful trader. Because it's such a mental game, and I think that that obviously working out, whatever working out means for you, is important. And you know, you see me, you might think you know that he works out, but I'm I'm pretty buff. I've just got to, I just like to drink beer on the weekends, you know, and I like to eat a lot too. So you know, you can't out move your mouth, and that's a little bit of my problem probably. But I've I've gotten pretty big over the years, and you know, I'm they call me Big Dave. I'm pretty big dude, <laughs> not just in girth. Anyway, but it's important to get your head on straight. So the morning pages and working out every day, and, and discipline gets used up. And that's something that I never really thought about. What's the guy's name? Um, he wrote, he uh, does the Dilbert comic. He wrote a pretty good book. It's called uh, How I Failed at Everything and Still Succeed or something like that. But he talked a lot about how discipline gets used up. And, and I noticed that, like when I would try to work out after work or in the middle of the day, I always had something going on to where I couldn't work out. It's like, well, I'm gonna work out after work. And, I, and at the end of the day, I was just so exhausted. I'm like, the last thing in the world I wanna do is go to the gym. Whereas now it's like I go and get that out the way. And I just think about the feeling, like when I push that door leaving the gym every morning, I feel so good. And that's, that's uh, one of the best times of the day. Now, everything I said, Scott Adams. Okay, yeah, good book, Scott Adams. And I, that should be on the Books to Read page too. And I'll put some links. There should be some links in this video, down below this video. And I'll make sure that link is in there. Now, some of you might be saying, I don't have all that time. And, well, you might have more time than you think. Have you watched Game of Thrones? Well, that'll take you 70 hours. And that seems a little skinny. I think it's, it might, I have to check my math on that one. Grey's Anatomy will take you 17 days to watch Grey's Anatomy. I know somebody who's going through Grey's Anatomy twice. So it's almost a month on the couch. Have you watched Yellowstone? 38 hours. And when I did it, it was 38 hours. This was, this was not counting the last, the current season or whatever. So that's probably 40 something hours there. Breaking Bad is 62 hours. What we do in the shadows, 40 hours. That seems like a lot, but that's what I found on the internet. And by the way, if you're gonna watch, that's so damn funny. It is raunchy, it is stupid. I nearly turned it off about halfway through the first episode. It was recommended to me, it's like, ah, this is stupid, I'm turning it off. And then the second episode came along and, and uh, I nearly peed my pants. So. If you're going to waste some time, that'd be a good one to waste some time on. But anyway, you have more time than you think. And and somebody who had, uh, he was a young guy and he hadn't been married that long. And they had, um, and then they had their first child after being married. And he was telling me how he had no time. And I was like, well, what would happen? I was like, what time do you get up? And he's like, I don't know, seven o'clock. I'm like, well, wake up at 5 a.m. every day. And you just gave yourself two hours. And it's like, you know, well, it's a commitment. And that's why I get up earlier. I, you know, I know I'm not going to be the smartest. I know I'm not going to be the strongest. And this is kind of like a Tim Ferriss, I think, argument or, or some of his people that are interviews. But I can work hard, okay? And I could be one of the hardest working people, and so could you. So get up two hours earlier every day. And it's like, well, 
won't you have to go to bed earlier? And yeah, probably, maybe, but you know, what are you doing anyway during those last uh, hour or so at night where you could go, maybe go to bed a little earlier, maybe watch one less thing if that's what you're doing. And, you know, I'm guilty of watching these shows, as I just admitted. And, and part of me, it's just, okay, I admit it, watch these shows. And the other thing is my wife likes, likes to watch television and that's sort of like, our thing we do together. So I used to pick up a laptop and, and work on a laptop at night and do those things. And, and I am kind of a little guilty of picking up my phone now with the crypto now that's heated up. But I real I come to realize that this is something she enjoys doing. And you know what? It's not that painful. So I do watch uh, some of these series or a, a movie. You know, we either watch a movie every night or or some series or something. Uh, I try to watch documentaries as much as possible. I do enjoy documentaries. I, I love learning something. I just watched the Madoff one. That was pretty good. A lot of, um, I won't spoil it for you, but um, turns out he was not a good guy. Interesting. All right. So, and Cora Amparo is attributed to Seneca. Oh, I have uh, some writings of Seneca that, I I haven't gotten around to um, to reading, so I need to do that. So uh, didn't he write some letters or something? Or oh, profitable methodologies, seasonal, rotational. Ah, uh, I don't I don't know. I think if you're doing something, see, I can only really talk about trend following. Okay, and. Trend following, the thing about trend following is you never know when a trend is going to come along. And even though the summers are usually bad times to trade, every now and then there's a great trend or great trends that come along in the summer. And maybe one of your biggest winners of the year will come along in the summer. Now, do be careful and, and do kind of take it easy. and don't, don't press the issue, especially if the market is choppy. But I don't know if there's any seasonality that you can depend on. And the problem, I, I don't know exactly what you're asking, Paul, but if you are doing something that, that seems to have a seasonal edge, the, the problem with that is it could not work for three or four years or more and still be statistically valid based on that edge. So that just seems like a long time to go. And then that edge really isn't that huge. Now, if that edge fits in with your trading edge, with the trend, then then knock yourself out and do that. So, but I, I'm not sure if that's the question you're asking. All right, as I've been alluding to and just saying outright, crypto has been heating up as of late. So let me get my crypto fired up and uh, I'll take a look at some of the questions that are stacking up. And then we could also, uh, if you wanna talk about any individual stocks, feel free to ask about them now. Also, in addition to all that, um, is this coming up? There it is. If there's any crypto you want, oh, look at that. I got an alert. Let's take a look at that. Oh, you can't see it. Let me uh, let me take a look at that. Okay, so let's just see what I got alert on. Labs, L-A-B-S. Okay. Okay, it's coming back in a little bit. So, Okay, so Paul's saying some say systems work at certain times. Yeah, I don't know about that. I think that's I think there's a problem with that. Uh, um, I'd have to see specifically what they're talking about. But I didn't I didn't know that crypto all of a sudden would start trending again, right? It just did, you know. And I guess the problem with what I want to show you here is we we had a rollover, but crypto started started moving again. Let's see if we can find something interesting. You see, like that's just kind of going straight up. So I don't know. Uh, I think you have to find something conceptually correct, like trend following, and then wait for it to work, as opposed to trying to figure out seasonally when it would work. Okay. Okay. So let me show you something that I'm long here. This one here, you can see the, the red line is where I got in. The green line is my initial profit target. And I just set the initial profit target at 
twenty percent. I think if the crypto market matures, then I might be I might have to actually adjust the volatility. You see, I'm under water in this one. This one's doing okay. You can see just kind of a nice little thrust higher followed by a pullback. Nothing magical there. I'm just slightly above the entry on this one. It's like the it's uh, crypto cooled off a little bit. These things are going straight up for a while along this one. Let's see, sand. Now I'm not betting a form on these things. And you could do things like 230 EMA breakouts. Okay, you've got one low above, two lows above, inner above this high. Would have gotten you there when the market starts breaking out. So now that it's heated up, my problem with this last leg is I waited for the market to heat up and then jumped in a little bit late. And I still caught some, a bunch of really great moves, but it would have been better to have been, to have been watching it because you never know when those trends are going to come along. And there's another one. I don't know where. Oh, yeah, see, I'm underwater on this one too. But what you could do when the market gets hot like it, it has been, I don't know if it's going to continue higher, but you could just sort by the strongest pairs. The only problem is I think this, anyone knows how to, set my time of day to maybe midnight my time so i'm seeing the the true moves and not just the the rollover move like i think it rolls over sometimes usually rolls over right around time i do the week in charts somewhere around six o'clock central but with a few caveats sometimes you could just seek out the strongest ones and just jump on board provided of course they're liquid enough one thing i learned recently was i on saturday i got in one and within like 20 minutes, I was it had hit the profit target, but I couldn't get my limit order off because there wasn't enough people buying it. It didn't kind of if it would have blown through that number, I would have I would have gotten my order off. But it was like either either it, it just touched it or it was like 0. 0.000001 away from it. And by the time I was able to get out, I actually lost money on the trade. But it was something that happened within like. 10 or 15 minutes and that's something where it's like oh i need to make a rule that hey when this happens i might need to get out see i would as crazy as it sounds i would buy this one that's going straight up and uh let me see if i can do that let me see if i can do it on the fly it might be harder than uh than i think but it's always fun to it's always fun to do a trade and then uh, talk about it in the next week of charts. Let's see if we can get in here. Um, LCX. I don't know if I have it in this. I'm going to have to go to another screen, but talk about. Let me just see if I can do this real quick for S and Gs. LCX. So when things are hot, no, I can't. I'd have to do it over on another screen. It's going to be too much trouble. But when things are hot, so just uh, let me just put a little line right here. So we'll see what happens. When things are hot, sometimes you could just you could just buy the ones that are going up. And in this case, I'd put in an IPT. Let's see. I put an IPT 20% higher. And I hate to use the word hope, but you hope that they could at least make it another 20%. So there we go. So that'll be a, a hypothetical entry on that one. Okay, so any questions in crypto? Let me just take a look at some of the, the major ones real quick, and then we'll uh, shift gears. Sheeb's always a lot of fun. And sometimes when Sheeb takes off, obviously it really takes off. And um, I got in and out of this one a few times. If I had just stayed in, I probably would have done much better. But something like the 230 EMA could be a good little system there. Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Ethereum was outperforming Bitcoin. Now it's underperforming Bitcoin, as you can see. Let's take a look at Bitcoin while we're at it. So you can see Bitcoin obviously taking off in here, okay? Two bars above the 30 EMA. Look to buy above the two bar high plus a little wiggle room. Little breakout strategy. Not a huge fan, to, not a huge fan of breakouts, but when you get in a market like this that really gets hot, breakouts can work really well. All right, any no questions on crypto? Okay, quiet bunch tonight. Let's shift gears. Let's go over to stocks. And uh, I'll take a look at, uh, oh, here we go. 
<laughs> okay, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that, Craig. So let's flip over to stocks real quick. And we'll take a look at the overall market. And then we'll drill down to some sector action. So Craig says, classic crypto, gold. Yeah, that's a thing. You know, gold is... Gold should be 10 times higher than what it is. And the reason I'm saying that is one of you guys said it would take an Olympic size swimming pool, but I've read before that all the gold in the world will fit in your backyard. My backyard's much smaller now. I used to be on six acres, so I know it would fit in that backyard. But as a general statement, all the gold in the world would fit in a, a fairly small area. And if everybody in the world, or most everybody in the world, wanted just this little tiny piece of gold, there certainly would be enough to go around. Well, why isn't gold 10 times higher? Well, there's a lot of paper gold out there. Now, you can make that argue for, argument for Bitcoin. At 21 million Bitcoin max, okay, that's enough for everyone in Florida to have one. I did an article on that. Or every other person in California. So Bitcoin should probably be 100 times higher than what it is now but the reason is there's a lot of paper bitcoin out there okay now you got derivatives you got veto and bt biti you've got um gbtc which i do own some gbtc but gbtc should actually have be a holder of bitcoin and i hope they are <laughs> i hate to even put that hint out there because i do own some but there's a lot of derivatives out there and i'd hate to say an exchange is disingenuous but who's to say you know because because there's so many exchanges that have gone under who's to say that some of these exchanges what you see what you see is not actually there so i'm just saying <laughs> okay classic crypto gold gld I'm not a bug, honest. Everyone said the intraday market association, intra market association of GLD inflation was broken over the last year, many years, very assets lost big time, except precious metals. Bring up the yearly gold chart, it's essentially flat. IOW gold outperformed every, what does that mean, IOW? Tradable asset in the face of a crazy shorting USD shorted the dollar, strong dollar and Fed yields on steroids. Everyone was on the strong dollar side of the boat. The wrecking ball when the US dollar broke in October. Okay, so if you're not familiar with intermarket technical analysis, here's one that one re one relationship that's almost direct and almost always if gold, if uh, let me just rephrase that, if, do if the dollar drops in value, it's gonna take more dollars to buy gold. So the dropping dollar actually will help gold. So we take a look at like UUP. UUP, I've been talking about for a while in the trading service. And UUP bow tied quite a long time ago. You see, well, it's sloppy, but it did bow tie and it had first thrust down and it topped out. So gold, yeah, that was kind of a head scratcher. Okay, we got the worst inflation ever. And what's gold doing? It's going straight down, or some of the worst inflation there. But I, I, I was a kid. I do remember Jimmy Carter days. That was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And then now gold is starting to go up. Let's call it breaking it, its upward trend. Reversal, real monetary inflation with associated with gold commodities reasserted itself. I shared GLD on the previous chart show with GLD was above 160, good, below 160, bad. Yeah, Tarzan speak. I can't argue with that. I mean, look at your bow tie back here, right? So far, good, warning, beware US dollar support. Yeah, Craig, I think you're onto something there. And, and you know, what did I just say? You have to throw conventional wisdom out the window, right? Well, conventional wisdom says gold's going to go up with all this inflation and all these idiots on the radio, oh, you better buy some gold, gold's going to go up. 
Well, gold went straight down, okay? And and they were so wrong for so long on that. But now gold's going up. Yeah, Dave, they were right. Inflation. Well, guess what? Inflation has started to come down, okay? And the reason gold's going up, it might have something to do with inflation, but it also might have something to do with the fact that, as Craig pointed out, the dollar is dropping and it's taking more dollars to buy gold. So, yeah, you can, um, there's a lot going on. But, yeah, good points, Craig. IOWs, in other words. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Uh, let me just bang out some charts real quick, and then we'll, we'll get to your stock picks. S&P 500, a bit of a bummer. Let's see if we can get the um, 50 and the 200 simple moving average. Today, we dropped below the 50 simple moving average. Longer term, I've been saying this for weeks and months, even. The market looks like it's bottoming. But the longer term trend is still down. We're still making lower lows and lower highs, okay? And I'm not a huge fan of trend lines, but you can connect the dots here or most of the dots or just look at the slope of the 200-day moving average. You can see the trend does remain down. And now we're below the 50 simple moving average. This looks like somewhat of a complex head and shoulders bottom. I like, you can't trade off a head and shoulders bottom, but Bottoms do sometimes form as head and shoulders or double bottoms like the NASDAQ has done. And usually I like it when the right shoulder is lower than the left. I don't want to see that happen in the market. But if we did take out this prior shoulder and stop short of the old lows, I think that would help to complete the bottoming process. As a trend falling more on, the market just has to start going up and making higher highs and higher lows. And so far, it really hasn't done that just yet. But one of the points I wanted to make by showing that TFM 10% system is that sometimes it takes time for a bear market for everything to work its way through the system. And now we've had 50 something weeks of bear market or at least a year. Now these things are starting to work their way through the system and eventually this market will start to bottom out. It does take time. And I do think that we are bottoming out, but you know what, trend following more on stuff, if it goes lower, much lower, I'll get stopped out of my longs and then I'll start shorting again. NASDAQ composite, that double bottom I just talked about, we pulled back a little bit in here. We're back below the 50. Like the P's, it, it didn't get through that resistance that it had back in December. So that's a bit of a bummer. And you can see we're still well below the 200 day moving average and the downtrend obviously still intact. Russell 2000, a bit of a bummer because it looked like it was closer to finishing its bottom than any of the other indices. And it began to take out the top of this little range in here, as you can see, but then it got thwarted and came back down. And we're just barely above that 50 simple moving average. GBTC is, uh, represents, represents Bitcoin, allegedly. <laughs> and uh, it's, it still has a 40 something percent discount to Bitcoin. So if you believe that one day that discount will come off, then this thing is trading at a 40% discount. One thing you have to remember though, is that asset in control by someone else will always, not always, but usually be worth less than an ass than your own asset, okay? So if you got your Bitcoin hodled on your little wallet or whatever, or if you look at the cash Bitcoin price, that's going to be relatively higher, in this case, 40% higher than the GBTC. Now, maybe if people begin to believe in GBTC, and maybe if they can they can convince the SEC to let them create an ETF out of this, maybe that premium will shrink to like 10% or 8% or 5% or something more in line with what you would expect it to be by an asset in someone else's hand. So there's some there's some risk in this. There's some there's something there. Why does it have a 40% discount? Energies had a little bounce today. They have double or triple tops, depending on how you want to look at it. I'd feel a lot better if we took out those those previous peaks in here. Metals and mining, though, look at that, blowing and going, maybe being helped along by the dollar, as Craig is pointing out. Good, uh, good thoughts, Craig. Nice Landry light, as you can see above that 50 simple. Uh, very overbought, though. I'm looking for, looking forward with this uh, market pulling back a little bit so I can get on some of these metals. 
what's CE next do? We got knocked out of this one and somebody said, look at it, Dave, you were right, but early. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Right, but early. My wife, as I often say, she's like, you're often right, but early. Anything you can do about that? I'm like, geez, I'm working on it, baby. If you guys like me, you probably um, don't want me to figure that out, though. You might never see my fat ass again. That would be a holy grail hunt, right? Uh, drugs, kind of hanging in there, but they have lost some steam as of late. One thing that concerns me a little bit, I'm not going not gonna to not trade, a little double negative there. Drugs or metals or whatever, but usually the the area that was its strongest, or especially like energies, usually the area that's its strongest during the bear market does not lead you out of a bear market. Okay, so uh, drugs did have a pretty good spill, so maybe they don't count. But let's take a look back at those energies. That's metals. Where's the energies? Yeah, so energy is probably the strongest area longer term throughout the entire bear market so maybe the energies will continue higher and we're long in ine right now so i hope they continue higher but longer term i don't think energies will lead us out of this bear market it's going to be something that's bottoming out you know crypto stocks is not enough of them but crypto stocks are bottoming out along with crypto so maybe some of those guys will take off and be some big winners Anyway, the bottom line is market's pretty mixed out there. Simmies I had high hopes for because they were taken out the top of this range, but they got whacked pretty hard today, as you can see. So they're kind of coming back into the soup. Longer term, look like they're putting in the bottom, kind of head and shoulder bottom. But wait for them to clear all this resistance in here, all these prior peaks, before getting too excited. All right, I think that's it. TLT, LT. When you say one year, Craig, you want to look at what a weekly chart or a monthly chart? Yeah, so Craig's saying that longer term trend lines are being broken with TLT. Let's take a look back at the daily. See, this is good because this means that rates are coming down a little bit. Bonds up, rates down, right? So this is this is pretty good. I I'd, I'd like to see rates come down a little. That'd be great. Oh, Loma or laugh my ass off? Oh, L O M A. Okay, L O M A. Um, let's get back to our clean chart. Yeah, this one, this one broke out, but it came all the way back into its base. Solid pass on that one. So first pullback after base breakout is a pretty good pattern to trade, as you probably know. But if it comes all the way back to the base, then all bets are off. So I would forget about it for that one. IQ, IQ. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, let's back it out a little bit, see what we got what we have going on. You've got a little bit of overhead supply to deal with. This bothers me a little bit. It's it's not, I, I'm gonna give it a not bad. Uh it's got plenty of volume though. Look at that. Is this um wow, it's got huge volume. Um as far as a setup is concerned, I don't like the way it, I don't like the way it, it, it's not a really big gap, but it did have a gap down after going straight up. This kind of irks me a little bit, but with all this volume, I think maybe, maybe on an intraday basis, this thing, it might be worth an intraday trade. I don't, I think it's okay for a position trade. It's just not, it's not jumping out at me, but it's, it looks, it's like I have to work to pick it apart, if that makes any sense. So. At first glance, I'm like, whoa, that looks fantastic. And then I'm like, well, you get a little over supply. Uh, the setup is not perfect. But I'm going to give you a not bad on that one. Bulk. Bulk. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, I always get, a, always get concerned when most of the trend is just a few wide range bars. But you've got quite a few bars in here in this trend higher. Like, if this trend was just these two like one or two big bars, I'm not as excited about them. It's not bad. It needs to pull back a little further. It does have some bad memories back here, but I'm, I'll give you a not bad on that one, John. I think that's I think that's pretty good. It might be worth watching on a pullback. So let's see what happens with a pullback. Rain, A-I-N. Yeah, this looks okay. Um, it kind of pulled back to that base like we talked about, but it's shot up so far. 
I, I give it okay on a deep pullback. It looks kind of interesting. A couple of things I just said though. Notice that you've got one, two bars in here are almost the entire trend. And then when you back the chart way out, you've got a lot of bad memories here. Remember, we're trading traders, not markets. Somebody asked me last week, well, how do you trade traders? Like, well, you know that there's a lot of people back here, traders or investors that are hanging on to this thing, looking to get whole. Uh, it might not be a bad problem to have though. If it pulls back any further, I'd pass because you're back into this base. But this thing might pop back out up to its old highs. Again, though, I like to position myself to where there's clear air. But yeah, for, for a swing trade higher possibly, but I like to go for more than just that, okay? So I would, I personally would pass, but I, I hear you on that one. TGB, TGB, what's that fast train, TGB? Yeah, this is worth, no, too much overhead, okay? It's not set up and you got a shit ton of overhead supply. So pass on that one for sure. Throw that one out right away. Dollar topped in October, precious metals, commodities, and Bitcoin took off. Track to USD, UPP with a little VIX in pretty much every time frame right now. All right, not enough time to, to start all that analysis, analysis from scratch, but let's do take a look at the VIX. When the VIX gets stretched 10% or more, the market tends to correct, and that's that was my big concern back here you can see the vix was getting pretty stretched and this is the s p 500 notice that the s p vix got stretched down here and then the s p rolled over now you got to be careful you got to wait for the actual rollover to start because sometimes you can get stretched and they get more stretched and even more stretched okay oh anytime stuart of course in which landry book is a buy uh the byline signal is not in any of the landry books but if you go to my YouTube channel, just go to YouTube. It's youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry, or you can go to YouTube and just do at YouTube. Or you could even go to my website, DaveLandry.com, and search for the TFM 10% system. And I think if you sign up for a uh, an introductory membership to the gold area, you don't you don't have access to all of gold. But there is a market timing course in there that has a TFM 10% system. So that might be the quickest way to get that. And that's you can find it on my website. And I, you know what? I need to put a link, start putting links out there. I'll put a link uh, down below. I think if you go to uh, become a better trader, davelander.com slash become dash a dash better dash trader. <laughs> I'll put a link in the uh, post. So what changed in October? Everything. Yeah, I agree. It's like uh, all of a sudden things begin to change. Okay, I'm going to have to wrap things up based on the time. I appreciate everyone being here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Looks like we set a record for the week. Fantastic. So the word's starting to get out. Fantastic. Everybody who's not in Facebook, I'll talk to you tomorrow. But everybody else, have a great weekend and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. Oh, you guys are welcome, of course, yeah. Thank you.